Hugo Chapman has worked at the British Museum since 1995, first as the curator of Italian and French drawings, and since 2011 as the Simon Sainsbury Keeper of Prints and Drawings. He's worked on a number of memorable exhibitions, among, the, among them Michelangelo, Closer to the Master, in 2005, for Angelico to Leonardo, Italian Renaissance Drawings, a show done with the Uffizi in 2010, and last year, Drawing in Silver and Gold, from Leonardo to Jasper Johns, which was also seen at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Prior to joining the British Museum, Hugo spent 10 years in the Old Masters Department at Christie's. His talk today is entitled, Parallels, Patterns, and Reversals, the British Museum is a template for collecting old masters. And in it, he'll look at the collection of collections that makes up the British Museum holdings, thus offering us an overview of the changing tastes across several centuries in the collecting of drawing. Please join me in welcoming Hugo. Thank you, uh, John, very much, and thank you, Colin, uh, for the invitation to come here. There's a worryingly large amount of people in the audience who I know, so fortunately the lights are out, so I can pretend you're all anonymous strangers and we'll never see each other again. Uh, really, the, um, I mean, r begin with, with this title, this idea of a, a template, which I uh, uh, introduced uh, at an early stage, and then actually working uh, on the, uh, the lecture, I, I realized that the British Museum was anything but a template, um, that we'd in fact uh, collected drawings in a very, very haphazard way. And I was reminded of the great phrase of the 19th century uh, Victorian um, historian of uh, the British Empire, John Robert Seeley, who spoke um, about how the British Empire had been um, really uh, gained through a fit of absence of mind. Um, and really uh, came to me very strongly that the modern British Museum is very keen on writing acquisition and policy statements. I write quite a lot of them myself. Um, we buy very little, um, but there was absolutely no acquisition policy or statement during the great time when the British Museum was acquiring drawings. Um, so I will leave for you to ponder on that. Um, but I think if the British Museum is really a cautionary tale, I think we should, as all cautionary tales of how not to collect, we should really begin at the beginning. And it begins with this man, uh, Hans Sloan. Hans Sloan uh, was born in uh, County Down in, in, in Ireland. He was uh, the son of a land agent working for uh, uh, um, Lord uh, Clanbrassel. And he comes, probably with the, the help of his father's patron, Lord Clanbrassel, he comes to London to study medicine. Uh, and then he goes off in pursuit of his medical career to Paris and to Montpellier. And his great break comes when he's in his 20s when he goes as a personal physician uh, to look after the Duke of Albemarle, who was the governor of um, Jamaica. This is in, in the, 16, uh, the, the 1680s, uh, 1687. And despite the fact that the Duke of Albemarle actually dies in the West Indies, this doesn't seem to have affected Sloane's career at all. Um, and while he is there, Sloane is collecting, beginning his scientific career, He's, he's making an enormous uh, collections of flora and fauna. And when he gets back to England, he publishes uh, his two-volume uh, book on the flora and fauna of the West Indies in 1707 and 1725. And this is the beginning of his scientific career. So he has his medical career. He's very successful. He, he's the king's doctor. Uh, but also he... Uh, has, uh, he's at the center of the Enlightenment scientific revolution in London. He replaces Newton as the uh, president of the Royal Society. And when he dies uh, in, 17, uh, 20, uh, in 1753, he has this enormous collection of 80,000 natural history specimens, 50,000 books and manuscripts, and 100 albums of drawings. 
And um, what he does is, 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 is uh, to give you a sense of that collection, um, is it's sort of encyclopedic quality, and it's really based around the library and the manuscripts. It is about understanding the world, the natural world, and, and the kind of di diversity of mankind in that growing sense of the world as it is being explored and discovered. And so uh, on the left is, is a drum that is uh, sent back from Virginia, and Sloan believes this to be uh, a native uh, American uh, instrument, but in fact it comes from Ghana. And so it's the, uh, very interesting, um, the, the kind of the stirrings of, of, of the slave trade. This has moved from Africa uh, to, uh, to America. He's a great collector of footwear uh, because he, uh, Sloan realizes that shoes are one of those things that almost all human societies have, but they come in all different forms and shapes and sizes, so he collects those too. And he's fascinated by costume, and so there are lots of drawings of costume. And also in that, the beginning, the stirrings of the understanding that mankind's history extends way beyond uh, that uh, described in the Bible, so hence the, 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 the stone axe. So what happens in 1753 uh, is that um, the government is told that they can buy this collection for £20,000, but it is worth £100,000. Now, that's always very successful with the British government. Um, um, so immediately they want it. Um, and the other very successful thing that Sloan's has, has, is the idea that if we don't buy this collection, it's going to be bought by foreigners. Because not that the British are particularly keen on culture, but if, if we can have it and, and exclude the British, that, uh, exclude foreigners, then it's really a very good thing. And so uh, Parliament doesn't actually give us any money to buy the collection, but what they do is they sanction a lottery. And the lottery is very successful. It raises the £20,000 to buy Sloan's collection. And it also has enough to buy the house at the top right, uh, Montague House, which is in Bloomsbury. We could have, funnily enough, have bought Buckingham, Buckingham House, where Buckingham Palace is, but it was considered to be too run down. And our history may have been very different if we'd been located there. So by 1759, we're up and running as a museum. So we, from the beginning, are very different from any other um, really sort of museum. It's not the beginning, it's, it's not a royal collection, it's not an aristocratic collection. It is the, this beginning in Sloan's, um, really enlightenment, library, and associated material that comes with it. And the way that it worked in those days is you could get a ticket of admission, you can see that at the top left, for that stern thing saying no money is to be given to the servants, um, which is probably how the trustees still regard the staff to this day. Um, <laughs> and a sense of, of what um, the kind of diversity of that uh, uh, is you get that marvelous drawing by Scharf just before, in fact, uh, the old Montague house is going to be pulled down to, pull, to put the, the great smirk building that we're all so familiar with today. So, um, in terms of uh, Sloan as a collector, I mean, he wasn't what any of you in this room would call a collector of drawings. Drawings were an adjunct uh, to his scholarly uh, interests. Um, and so he employs uh, George Edwards to make drawings of the, of the kind of the skins and, and bodies that are being sent back from all over the world, uh, in this case of monkeys, this rather wonderful sort of professorial orangutan at the top left. Um, and another work that he has uh, is this great uh, album on, on vellum of Maria Sibylla Merian, who has gone to Suriname in, in, in um, South America and made drawings of flora and fauna there. And we know this album was one of the things that you're allowed to see on your half-hour tour of Montague House. Remembering that in the, although we go on a lot about how we're in enlightenment, institution, which is true. Actually, it was very difficult to get in. I mean, only 13,000 people used to go and see it in the 1790s. Today, 6.8 million uh, see it. So it's a very, very different place indeed. I mean, Sloan's claim to be a collector of drawings in our sense would be because of his ownership of this album and a couple of other albums, but this one particularly, uh, this extraordinary album of Dura drawings. 
uh, which we don't know where um, he bought them. We just know he bought them in Holland. Um, and they come from a, a whole group of albums put together by this extraordinary Dutchman called uh, P Peter Spearing Silverkrona, who worked for Queen Christina of Sweden uh, in the first half of the 17th century. Uh, and he comes back to Holland, where he comes from uh, in the 1650s, to Delft. And all these albums, including this one, have, uh, 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 have a stamp 1637 on it. Now, this album uh, is famous, and probably, probably the reason why maybe Sloan bought it was uh, the great natural... Was that me, or was that... Am I buzzing? <laughs> um, is um, these great natural history drawings. So the, this one of the, um, uh, the rhino there, at uh, the top left. But also, uh, you see at the bottom right, uh, a, a wonderful Berkmeyer drawing that's in the same album that's recording the costume of Aztec. So absolutely central to what Sloan is interested in. But I think there were, you know, the album contains many other things and many other things that I think Sloan would have found interesting. So just to kind of limit it to he was interested in the rhino was probably uh, too prescriptive. I mean, Sloan was deeply religious, so uh, Dura's marvelously uh, moving drawing of, of Christ, which he inscribes top left uh, as having been done after his illness. And just I put out a number of things there. And even Sloan's interest in footwear is, is shown by, uh, this is the bottom right, there's a design by Dura for his, for his shoes, um, which he sends off. And we now, thanks to this, we know um, what Dura's uh, foot size is. Um, an eight and a half, by the way, if you're thinking of. Um, um. So I think Sloan is, is a very particular kind of, drawings collect, and one that we probably will encounter historically, one in which drawings form a very small mosaic part of a, of a much bigger whole, uh, and was not collecting them as art, was really collecting them for information. So really very different from a lot of the collectors uh, that later formed um, the British Museum's uh, holdings. Now, this is a familiar figure here. Um, this is a category that I've just put together, which is the incidental collector. This is uh, Thomas Phillips, who you see on the far right, who's famous as a collector of manuscripts. He owned a, a staggering 60,000 illuminated manuscripts, which he bought because his family were rich from Manchester cotton. Um, and on one occasion, and on one occasion only, did he buy drawings. He bought them in large numbers, uh, and that was at the sale of uh, the Lawrence Woodburn sale. Now, this is, I have to sort of digress slightly in order to tell you the sad history of Thomas Lawrence's collection, which is, causes, for anybody who works at the British Museum, deep sadness, because it's a tragic. Uh, we were offered the whole of Thomas Lawrence's collection in 1830 for 18,000 pounds, and we didn't buy it, um, and we should have done. Um, so Thomas Lawrence, as all of you know, is is the great fashionable portrait painter of his day. Um, he begins his collection uh, in the early 1820s by buying the collection of William Young Otley, the man uh, in the engraving to the right. And William Young Otley is the leading uh, connoisseur of Italian drawings. He's in Italy in the 1790s, just when Napoleon's army is coming into Italy. Huge amounts of opportunity. Basically, you had the choice to sell your collection to Otley for a very small sum or have it looted by the French. Quite a good time to be around. Um, um, and so he brings back, and also Otley has this extraordinary knowledge. Uh, he is in that, the, the, the new wave of interest in the beginnings of Italian art. So he's interested in, in 15th and 14th century things. Um, so L Lawrence begins by buying Otley's collection and then he keeps on buying fed by the man on the right, Samuel Woodburn, the great prints and drawings collector of the day. So when Lawrence dies in 1830, it's offered to the BM and to others, uh, and it, it, it never, uh, we, we don't take up uh, that opportunity. But um, there are various, uh, Woodburn organizes various exhibitions, he sells bits of the collection, but whenever those collections that he's sold off come back onto the market, he buys them. And by, on his death in 1853, 
really huge amounts of uh, Lawrence's collection is intact. And that there's this spectacularly uh, rich sale in 1860 called the Lawrence Woodburn Sale. So when all of Lawrence's plus Woodburn stock is dumped on the market, this huge glut, it is a great time to be buying. And um, that seems to be the occasion when Thomas, uh, Thomas Phillips, who hitherto has shown no interest at all in drawings, seems to have really decided this is when he's going to buy. And so he buys roughly 1,800 drawings in, 18, uh, uh, in, in that 1860 sale. And the majority of those drawings have come to the British Museum because uh, uh, in, in the 1940s they were catalogued by a predecessor of mine as keeper, Popham, uh, A.E. Popham, and then the whole collection was bought by Count Zeilen of the Courtauld fame, who took a very few of them for his collection, which are now in the Courtauld, but the rest, the bulk of them, he donated anonymously to the British Museum. So we see here some of the drawings that Thomas Phillips, with absolutely no knowledge, uh, seems to have sort of decided rather randomly what to buy. So these are some of the single lots he bought. So the one on the left by Mantegna, goodbye. The one in the center, um, Fra Bartolomeo, described as Fra Bartolomeo, uh, is a rather bad copy after Raphael, not such a great buy. The one on the far right, he paid a staggering 44 pounds for. Described as by Raphael is not by Raphael. It sits in an unmounted box in the British Museum. So we're just, as a, because I'm a very, very sad um, kind of provenance-obsessed person, I went once through our entire, uh, what, what we had over the years acquired from the uh, Lawrence Woodburn cell with the price, prices on them and put, and so I can tell you with that 44 pounds, what you could, if we all enter into our time machine, what we could have bought, uh, so we could have bought these two drawings by Leonardo. They, they would have cost you three pounds and six pounds. So let's say nine pounds, okay? Um, then we could have had this one. <laughs> this would have cost us 10 guineas uh, by Michelangelo, study for the Battle of Kashina. And we'd have still had money left over to buy a Haman. That would have cost us 11 guineas. Um, and to finish it all off, we could have bought the Epiphania too, all for that 44 pounds on the right. So basically, yeah, um, Phillips really didn't know what he was doing. Uh, but what he did do, because he bought lots of the cheap lots, he did very well in those. Uh, so this is, I put together just um, as many of I can find in this lot, described 12 in the lot at the bottom. So these, not so great. Um, the next one, a Pacetti, Trotti, okay, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, but the really good ones is, you know, you've got uh, the Massaletta uh, in the center, which probably is by, by Massaletta. Uh, you've got a Gatti for the Staccata on the left, and a very, very early on the far right, uh, the earliest uh, study by Guido Reni for a painting uh, from the, for the mid 1590s, a bit battered. Even better than that, in that same lot, was this drawing by, by Rosso, which um, is a, a nice example of him having looked at the, um, the Sistine uh, ceiling by Michelangelo. So that's really where we benefited hugely, was these sort of, these mass lots uh, bought, put together at, at the Lawrence Woodburn sale. Now, our collection is really, uh, as I've said, not an aristocratic or royal collection. It is predominantly a 19th century collection. Um, with, but with, there are pockets of 18th century things. And one of those pockets uh, is this uh, album, which again is a sort of incidental, accidental collector, because this belonged to the second son of the Duke of Devonshire, uh, who, uh, Lord James Cavendish, um, who was a soldier and clearly you know, father was trying to get his son to be interested in what he was interested in and put together an album of drawings, um, which clearly didn't have any effect because James Cavendish never collected anything else. But, um, but, and this is then preserved in the family and then comes to us, uh, is bought by us in the early 50s. And it's a wonderful kind of uh, snapshot of, of 18th century English collecting. And we're going to hear more about Lely, but... Three of these drawings here are from Lili's collection, and you get the idea of really Lili as being 
the founding father of, uh, of British drawings collection uh, with his penchant for 16th century drawings here very strongly. Um, there's very little early, there's very little Quattrocento material. The one on the left is probably the earliest thing here. We don't know when this album was put together, but we, uh, it, some of the drawings have the collector's mark of Flink, which is, uh, we know that the Duke of Devonshire bought in 1723. So um, we can sort of post-date it to then. The other thing is very strong is this Roman, the, the, the strength of Roman drawings. Um, so uh, we have uh, Cavalier d'Arpino, Benini, and something I think we tend to forget, uh, which is the extent to which um, uh, Duke of Devonshire was collecting con really contemporary work. Um, that on the left is a drawing by Maratta, which is a drawing for a sculpture in the Lateran, which dates from 1715. So, um, although they all look like old masters to us now, then, uh, you know, Maratta was, was, was a, a, a modern master. And I think that's, again, a, a pattern if we're looking at how collecting is changing. This coming together, as Colin mentioned, of, of putting together old and new is something um, that I think is, is, is happening again. Um, and if we look at the Cavendish album, what's interesting is there's not very much uh, north of the Alps. Um, clearly, all the wonderful flink drawings that the uh, Duke of Devonshire bought, he wanted to keep for himself. So there's no Rembrandts, there's um, none of those wonderful Van Dykes. Uh, and even, you know, the Vellet is, is not from his collection. Um, and even the, the, the non-Italian drawings have, have a very strong Italian that feels. So this drawing is by Shaw, uh, which is a study for an engraving made in Rome, um, and Claude, or possibly not by Claude, um, uh, again, is one of those artists, uh, one of those non-Italian artists that crops up a lot in 18th century collecting. Um, so... Um, that gives a sense of 18th century collecting. And the other um, sort of touches of the great Cavendish collection that, that are with us are due to um, um, tax, resolving tax bills. In 1957, we got two albums. We got the Claude Liber Veritatis, uh, which is a record that Claude, Claude makes of the paintings leaving his studio. Uh, and I've just put up an example here, a painting that you know very well. It's in the Frick, where he's recording who it's done for, Bishop of Montpellier. So an amazing record, but just that extraordinary taste for Claude that there is. Um, and the other album uh, that we're going to look at uh, slightly later, I think, too, is uh, this one, uh, which is the Van Dyck Italian sketchbook, which uh, belongs uh, to Lili. And of course, um, you know, one of the very strong drivers in collecting in England uh, is through artists. And, you know, they're collecting it for very practical reasons. Lili does not go to Italy. And this is his way of understanding Italian painting through the eyes of, of, of Van Dyck. And so on the far right, you have um, two paintings now in Washington uh, that Van Dyck uh, copies. He thinks both are by Titian. Actually, the one on below is actually by, by, now is by Moroni. Um, and he also makes little drawings along the way. So the, the one in the lower left is of a, a witch in Palermo. And the one in the top, uh, the top left is just, I think, something that we uh, drawings uh, scholars often forget about is the importance of prints. I mean, even when Van Dyck is in Italy, the works that he often copies are prints because they're so much easier for him to assimilate uh, to understand the work of the great Italian masters, in this case, the design of Raphael. So um, that is, um, we then turn really to a proper collector, somebody who actually did leave their collection uh, rather than um, have it um, come to us much later. And that is uh, this, um, the Reverend Claude uh, Clayton Mordant Cratcherode, um, one of those sort of wonderful English names. Um, whose collection comes to us in the 17, 1799. He's a trustee of the British Museum. He uh, is uh, a, a incredibly shy and retiring. Um, he, he studies in Oxford, and Oxford is as far as he ever goes in terms of his travels. He um, he's never goes abroad, um, and he uh, is a collector of kind of exquisite 
taste. Very, very refined, Doesn't, is not a huge collector. Um, there are about 662 drawings that, that we have by him, um, and uh, somewhere between uh, five and 10,000 uh, prints. But it's when you look at the print collection, above all his Rembrandt prints, you get a sort of sense of this extraordinary discernment and, and this beginning of, uh, as, as catalogues are being published, of, of refining your collection. So here he is uh, with just one, I've just chosen out of randomly one print um, in Crutchrow's collection. So this is the first date of St. Francis under a willow on vellum, just in dry point, but he also then has it uh, in Japan paper in the second state with the etching. He also has it in on ordinary paper. And on the far, uh, the lower right corner, you will see this D there, um, which is the, the mark of uh, the caricaturist Robert Dighton. Because Robert Dighton uh, comes in and befriends the then assistant librarian who looks after the prints and drawings, uh, a man called Robert Bellow. Uh, and he uh, befriends him, he's completely trusted, and he, what he does is he begins to steal um, the Cratch Road prints, and he assembles this extraordinary, fantastic collection of Rembrandt prints. He makes a mistake at the end of going to see um, um, Woodburn with an extraordinarily rare Rembrandt print, and Woodburn remembers the only other time he's ever seen it is Cratch Road's collection. He goes to the British Museum, and funnily enough, they can't find it. Um, but, um, but Britain being Britain, we couldn't admit it. So what we, we just, we, we sort of uh, asked him to return whatever he'd stolen, but it was too embarrassing to kind of arrest him. Um, and so there are still lots of, uh, um, you know, things come on the market that probably come from Cratch Road. The other extraordinarily embarrassing thing is that no inventory had made of the Cratch Road's collection. So we had no idea uh, what was there and what was missing. Um, and, um, but as a result of that, the Department of Prints and Drawings actually becomes a department separate in 1808. Um, and if we look at the drawings uh, from Cratch Road's collection, it's very much a, a collection which I think is formed by a print collector, very much guided by his taste for prints. But again, that I extraordinary sense of, of taste and, and selection. So just some of the Rembrandts that he has, a wonderful um, uh, uh, drawing by Van Dyck, which is currently on, on view at the Frick of, of, um, uh, of Gentileschi. Um, in terms of, uh, with his Italian drawings, uh, guided by the fact he has an amazing Marc Antonio collection, he's looking, he's looking at, uh, he, so Raphael is one of his favorites. Um, is that me or? Um, perhaps I should throw you my. Um, um, but, I mean, 16th century, this, the collection is good but not great. I mean, and really he's relying on, on uh, uh, it's before the great kind of Napoleonic floodgates have opened. Uh, and so, again, Lely comes a lot. Um, but he's particularly strong in the 17th century, just because of, I think, there are just more drawings on the market. And I think it's something to always bear in mind when we're judging collectors, is what is there on the market. Um, for example, uh, the one on the, I mean, Cratch Road did think he had Michelangelo's, but the one on the top left is a copy. Of the drawing is in, in, uh, in the Tyler Museum. He also thought he had Correggio's, uh, but none of the Correggio's are right, um, because the, the Correggio's that came, came later on, uh, when uh, the kind of, um, Na Napoleon had sort of shaken the whole kind of tree and, and huge amounts uh, went on the market. Um, a different, I mean, in a way, similar taste in what he collected um, is this man, Richard Payne Knight, um, whose bust is on, on the far right, uh, collecting very much the sort of in the same areas as, as um, uh, Cratch Road in terms of he's collecting uh, coins, coins and medals, he's collecting antiquities. But Payne Pay Knight is really a, a very, very public figure. He, uh, he's uh, g 
goes off to Italy on the Grand Tour with cousins in tow in the 1770s. He writes a book on aesthetics called The Principles of Taste. Um, he writes about Homer and much of his collecting of, of um, Greek coin is about his understanding uh, the lineage of Homer. He declares that the Iliad is by Homer and the Odyssey is not. Uh, he's a man of very strong views. Famously, when the, um, when the Elgin marbles first came to, to London, he declared that they were Roman copies. So not a man afraid to kind of give his... Um, so very different from Cratchrode, who you, there's barely no opinion at all ever. Uh, nothing written by him has survived. Um, but immediately when we look at Payne Knight's collection, we see... Uh, that by the time that he's collecting in the 1820s, uh, early drawings are coming on the market. Um, on, on the left, uh, a drawing that we think, um, until maybe we're told um, tomorrow, uh, that it has got a, a bizarre mount on it. Um, and, uh, but the composition of it is, is dominated by um, Italian drawings. Quarter of his 1,000 drawings are Italian. And of course, he also owns some paintings too. So the Mantegna uh, Adoration at the Met, that is a, a, a painting that is owned uh, by, um, uh, by, by Payne Knight. Uh, and it's this shift in taste that's really happened through co collectors and connoisseurs like Otley going to Italy and you know really wanting to explore the beginnings of 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 Italian art, um, and it is very much coloured by Payne Knight's strong views. I mean, he's is uh, loves Raphael, has nine of them in his collection. He doesn't think much of Ma Michelangelo. He um, he he famously criticised uh, the, the Sistine Chapel as, as being as being turgid. Um, I hope that Carmen is not in the building, otherwise. Um, um, and so there's only, there's only one Michelangelo drawing uh, that he owns. But he does have uh, extraordinary uh, things, like the, the great Anible cartoon and the beautiful Barocci. Um, but again, uh, it's a very broad collection. It's, uh, he's keen on 17th, 17th century. Uh, his 17th century drawings are very high quality, so Guercino and Mattia Preti. Uh, and he has a particular feel and love of Salvator Rosa. Um, and um, there's one on panel, uh, just this, and he, what he loves is that kind of extraordinary kind of immediacy and uh, vibrancy of, of, of Rosa. Uh, and the other artist that he loves above almost all others is Claude. And he has an enormous collection of Claudes. So out of 291 French drawings, 274 of them are by Claude. Um, so we have Claude in the British Museum, every single type of Claude, you know, Claude animals, Claude... I mean, I'm not complaining. I mean, they are wonderful. <laughs> uh, but um, with the Lieber and this, you know, Claude... Don't ever offer us any more Claude drawings. Uh, but I think, again, as... Um, thinking about the Duke of Devonshire and that collecting of the old and the collection of the new and how those two tastes come together, that's very, that's very apparent with Payne Knight. Is he's also a collector, unlike Cratchrode, who has no interest in, in modern drawings. Uh, Payne Knight does. And you can see his taste it is quite varied, but uh, coloured by his old master taste. So he's, has, he's hot, uh, he has um, a Hogarth uh, oil sketch, uh, he has Gainsborough, he has Lawrence, a, lo a lovely drawing of Emma Hamilton, the top right. Uh, but the artist that he really likes is, is, is Mortimer, John Hamilton Mortimer. And you can see, you know, his love of Rosa and his love of Mortimer coming together very strongly uh, in works like this. It's a very kind of old mastery taste uh, in, in, uh, for, um, for expressed uh, in, in his love of uh, Mortimer. Um, thinking about, um, I mean, probably the most important collection uh, to the British Museum uh, is offered by, uh, by this man on the left, John Malcolm of Paul Tollock, who's a Scottish laird, whose family were rich from uh, sugar plantations in the West Indies, um, but he also makes a huge amount of money from land speculation uh, in Australia. And... Uh, 
he uh, begins rather like, I mean, following very much in the pattern of, of, um, of, of Lawrence, in that he begins by buying the collection of the man on the right, who's uh, John Charles Robinson, um, who is uh, really the equivalent of Otley. He's the great expert of his day. Uh, he's, uh, um, Robinson is born in Nottingham, uh, modest, uh, modest parents. He goes to train as a painter in Paris. He goes every day to the Louvre. He builds up this extraordinary kind of encyclopedic knowledge of decorative arts, of paintings, of prints. Um, and he starts uh, collecting. At the same time, he is working, he comes back to London, he works for, these, uh, for, for this sort of the new V&A, Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, called the South Kensington Museum. And so he's collecting for the museum and he's also collecting for himself. And in 1870, he sells his collection uh, of um, 425 drawings to Malcolm. And out of the 970 drawings uh, that Malcolm uh, gives, uh, that we have from Malcolm, that's, that's a sizable proportion. So 425 of them come from uh, from, from Robinson. And Robinson and Malcolm together, kind of uh, in the beginning, are working very closely together. And I suppose that's really the kind of ideal partnership, where you have somebody extraordinarily rich and somebody extraordinarily knowledgeable. Um, and they actually fall out in the end, as almost inevitably the case. Um, but what Malcolm um, uh, and Robinson do together is they really make up, in part, the great failure of the museum to buy uh, from the Lawrence collection. So these are just some of the Lawrence drawings that comes to the museum through Malcolm's collection. Um, I don't, well, you, the names are up there. Um, so you can see the extraordinary quality that is there. Uh, I mean, the other thing that's very apparent um, with uh, Malcolm's collection is that he has a real taste for the early, uh, that, that trend that we've seen beginning uh, with uh, Payne Knight, um, really with Otley, is continuing. So more than 40% of the drawings that come to us were done before the death of uh, Michelangelo in um, um, 1564. So it's, it's very, very strong in early drawings, including you know, the, the drawing in the top right, uh, the Botticelli, which was sort of, a, was, it's Robinson who, who recognizes that it is by Botticelli. It's been on the market as by Mantegna, by Verrocchio, but Robinson immediately knows who it is, who it's by. Um, and um, the overall quality is extraordinary in Malcolm. And I think that is a new, something new is happening in British collecting. And that is um, this idea that you're collecting and collectors are working towards an exhibition. And that is a new phenomenon. And that is because uh, Robinson uh, is forming, uh, has formed, a, um, uh, the, is the first president of the, the Burlington Finite, Fine Arts Club, which is a sort of group of collectors um, formed in the 1860s, 1866. And they put together exhibitions of drawings or works in their collection, of, 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 could be oriental, it could be all sorts of things, but obviously Malcolm, it's drawings. And so um, this is the, the, the first one where you get um, an exhibition of, uh, of, 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 of uh, Michelangelo. And of course, you know, many of them are from uh, Malcolm's collection. Uh, and similarly, uh, a, a, a one that follows is Dutch Masters. So you, Really, it's about collecting the masterpiece. It's a very, very different type of collecting that's happened before. The old 18th century idea of a collector sitting, showing his portfolios to his friends uh, of a kind of evening with a glass of wine, and there are good ones and there are bad ones. This has now become about the masterpiece and about exhibiting it as a kind of, you know, drawing as a great trophy of your taste and in fact, he, defi he says very clearly that his ethos as a collector is to collect genuine specimens of the highest aesthetic quality by the greatest masters and with the best provenances. And the great triumph of the British Museum is the, is the, the man of the low left is Sidney Colvin, 
who becomes a keeper in 1883. He was director of the Fitzwilliam, but he comes to be a keeper of prints and drawings, and he steers Malcolm's collection into the British Museum uh, through putting on an exhibition of it, and then when Malcolm dies, he gets the uh, trustees to write to the treasury to get the 25,000, which was a huge amount of money, but not as much as um, had Malcolm had spent on the collection. And because of that, we have this really that kind of uh, establishes our great Renaissance collection. And I think it's that sort of sense of super refinement uh, that Malcolm has brought in, you see is, is a new element in collecting, the sort of drawings toward, towards a collection. Um, and that is really shown above all in this collector, César Mange d'Oc, um, who was, as the name suggests, was French. His connection to England was that he was sent uh, around the time of the First World War to a probably horrible English prep school. Um, and that's, a, that's looking, you know, looking, you know, as one would be, as a sort of small, just, you know, kind of rather aesthetic-minded French boy surrounded by horrible cricket-playing Englishmen. Um, but he comes to the British Museum and he is allowed in to look at our drawings. And he remembers this for the rest of his life. Um, and uh, he, he's a successful dealer. He works here in, 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 in New York with a Seligman. And when he dies, he leaves 16 uh, Impressionist and post-Impressionist drawings to the, to, the, uh, to the British Museum. I can't say the French were very happy, but um, um, so this is the, the, the kind of the quality of the works. So Van Gogh, fantastic Delacroix, um, and this um, extraordinary uh, Degas. Um, and that, you know, only 16, but my goodness, what an amazing 16. And, and that, I mean, I know that César Mange de Hoque is, is a model for a number of collectors here in New York. Um, I won't say any names at this, but um, that kind of exquisite, not just going for the right one uh, with that kind of discipline um, is, 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 some, is, a, is a policy that he um, pursued with great success. Um, really, I suppose, a dying world of, of collecting is the, the, the scholar um, curator as collector. Um, and here we look at Campbell Dodgson, who was um, a curator and later keeper of prints and drawings. Um, and he's really famous with us because uh, at a time when the British Museum you weren't allowed to buy works by living artists. Campbell Dodgson bought works by living artists in order that they could be given uh, to the British Museum on his death. And so here are just some of the amazing prints that come our way. He's principally a print collector, and his great scholarly works is a, is a scholar of German uh, woodcuts. Um, but he also, on his death in, in, in uh, 1948, uh, leaves uh, drawings of the same type, so a Seurat and a, and a Redon, um, and some old masters, and I suppose very much familiar, you know, as, as one would expect, um, they, are, they, they, they are northern, so it's fantastic, Baldung, and it's rather, I have to say, is it by Heimskirk, but whoever it is, I don't know, but it's an amazing thing. Um, but probably a kind of mark of, you know, the, what's changed and something that's never going to happen again, this drawing comes onto the market in 1930 by, by the Windischer Woman by Dürer. It's of a type that the British Museum does not have. Um, and it fetches um, 5,000 pounds, which in 1930 is a hell of a lot of money. Uh, Dodgson gives 2,000 pounds of his own money uh, towards the acquisition and then raises the other money through his friends. Um, I have to say that is not something I'm ever going to be able to do. Uh, <laughs> So that world is gone. I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe John, you're kind of uh, <laughs> buying the Raphaels. So but, you know, that world, uh, both that combination of drawings being expensive but not so expensive and curators, uh, unless maybe we find a new policy of, you know, kind of hiring oligarch sums or something like that. Um, but I think that scholarly, uh, that scholar collector um, is, is probably an endangered species. I mean, there are, have been some, of course, like Alfred Meyer, for example, um, but I think they're few and far between these days. Um, and to end with, just to, I mean, really, uh, how that it is a collection of collections, that in fact, 
the British Museum is, in terms of what we've bought as curators over the years, is relatively small. I think there are 10,000 drawings out of 50,000 that have been bought. Um, and so I've just you know, had fun by um, sort of picking out some of the, the, the very good things that we did buy. So we did, for example, in 1860 in the, in the Lawrence Woodburn sale, we bought quite a lot there. Um, you know, um, we could have had the whole lot, but um, so, um, so we, we, you know, there, there have, it, it can't be said that curators in the 19th century, but we really began quite late. I mean, really not until the 1830s did we get going. And in the, in, in the 20th century, we've really had no money. Uh, and really, the collecting has, has been um, through the Art Fund, which is an arts charity formed in 1903 that gives money. So they, for example, uh, bought outright this wonderful Ang. Or it's through Export Stop. Uh, uh, so the drawing on the far right was bought by Jacob Bean in 1963 for 27,000 uh, pounds. And then the British Museum with the art fund, got the money uh, to acquire it, uh, much to the chagrin of, of Jacob Bean. But, you know, obviously I'm delighted that was the case. Um, so, you know, in many respects, we understood the art market for a long time. Um, then this happened, um, which is the disaster of 1984, when we were offered by the trustees of the, of the Chatsworth estate uh, 70 amazing drawings for five and a half million pounds. Um, and uh, we said that was too, too expensive. They decided to put them in, on the market and they made almost 20 million. Um, and at a stroke, I mean, that was entirely due to really a director of the BM who really didn't like drawings very much and thought they were sort of snooty and not of great interest. And a, a rather unworldly keeper who didn't share the information and ask some of his curatorial colleagues who knew a great deal more and would have said, yes, go for it. Um, so that has been a disaster and has taken long, long years uh, under the great uh, leadership of, of Anthony Griffiths, my predecessor, to kind of return the British Museum to a semblance of what we were before, somebody who really did understand this sort of meeting between the market, dealers, collectors, and the museum. Um, and to end with, um, I have these two drawings, which um, uh, come from uh, an album, like many things, good things that come our way through death and taxes. Uh, um, I would say that you know, th those are the two immutable things, but of course now, you know, for the very rich, taxes is just an option. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but I think all of us should take heart from this idea that on the left, we cannot have everything. Uh, that there are some drawings that are going to go to elsewhere and that we need, in all things, to be steadfast, uh, like that ship rocking on the sea. So with those words, I offer those to you in your collecting uh, future. Thank you.